Excellent. Cool. Well, let's do it. Ziggy, it's good to see you, man. <laughs> <laughs> good to see you too, man. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'll just like the preamble I always give on these is like, look, every, you know, few weeks we like, you know, work with one of the founders in a slow portfolio company. We like to kind of have like just a pretty open-ended discussion, um, which we can kind of have people from the slow portfolio and kind of our world participate in live. And then also obviously we share it out to the community. So I appreciate you joining to talk about no code and business operations. Um, My pleasure. <laughs> something you and I both care a lot about <laughs> in particular. So I'm kind of curious, like, I mean, I think, you know, we can obviously take this in a bunch of different directions and we should just kind of bullshit. And since you're here, Alex, you should join in as well. I mean, you have a lot of experience with this stuff as, as well. Um, but I'm kind of curious, like, what in the last year, I mean, the, the buzz around like RPA, no code, low code, you know, improving back office operations has obviously been like, it's been all over the place, like from the narrative perspective. What are you actually like, what are the most important things, interesting things that are actually happening though, that you're seeing like on the ground versus kind of the hype? I'm kind of curious where your head's at these days. You, I think first of all, you're absolutely right that there's a lot of noise. And there's a lot of like, oh yeah, you know, this is going up. Oh no, actually this is going down. The pandemic actually showed that, you know, people need more automation, but then people don't have budget to invest in strategy projects. You know what I mean? So there's like a lot of conflicting concepts, but something tangible that, um, you know, literally happened, I think for us three times in the last 10 days was, um, uh, IT organizations coming and saying, oh, we're looking for a platform for, you know, workflow automation, or we're looking yeah. for a platform for, you know, faster way to, you know, and, and I think that's something, and, you know, been, I've been trying to do this thing for like four years now, that didn't exist four years ago, right? And so that is definitely very tangible, forget everything else, and like, tell you about service we did, and we can talk about that, but like, tangibly i think that is something that i haven't seen a few years ago and it started to look and do you think it's just coming as like pressure from business teams like my sense is like it my experience with a lot of like the low code no code business operations platforms is like it's general job historically has been to just say no like people <laughs> want to do stuff and then like it is the blocker they're not like the advocate of this understandably there are privacy concerns there's like a lot of like complexity to actually pulling it off and making it valuable so like i get that i'm kind of curious though like is your sense that what basically happened is like the business teams have gotten far enough through to like leadership that like the it teams now like kind of have to move or like they're being forced to move or like has something else changed um so i think this so in, when you actually talk to some cios there's this there is this shift I, uh, that I'm hearing about, like what, how do you even measure, what's the OKRs or like objectives for IT? And I think cost saving was like, you know, and, and obviously, you know, um, security and compliance and some of those more traditional ones uh, were the only ones that mattered. And I, yeah. and I do, and I do think that this is changing. Well, you know, when we can hypothesize of why. But there's definitely a change in in some of the some of the conversation where they literally say, "Yeah, we, we're measuring our own team, like the IT organization, on sales velocity. We're measuring our own IT organization on um, quote to cash, like mm -hmm. you know things that are like uh, what, <laughs> right? But like they're looking at their project that they're investing in, and they need to justify their projects of how they're impacting." the sort of the bigger business goals and that is something i do think the 2020 situation um helped because when you're in a situation where like okay guys where can we cut where can we be more um uh uh you know realistic about it or like um thinking um through like what is the fat and what is the actual sort of bones yeah. um then you need to justify everything so it's sort of like start to be this type of trend I think the yeah. second part though, sorry, go on. Just, to, I mean, I just, I, I think that's a really good way to put it. I mean, I think that the, you know, in the pre-pandemic days, I feel like even like working on Finn, I'm not sure if you felt this way working on Tonkin, like you'd have a lot of conversations with people who were like, yeah, 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 we like this. This makes sense in theory. But like, there's just so little pressure on a lot of these back offices, right? Except for startups. Like startups, like 
usually, well, interestingly, early startups care, but then the startups that are real rocket ships have the same thing. We're like, look, we have other problems, like growth, whatever, like, and like the pandemic really did massively change that by like creating some pressure and urgency um, from like a cost reduction perspective, for sure. But I didn't mean to cut you off. What was your second point you wanted to No, make? no, and, and th that, you know, that is the core of it. And then I think that same core point, if you think about not from IT perspective, but from the business perspective, uh, you know, operations and, and you know you know you know we've been talking about it for the last several years but like that concept of operation teams um was really nascent like several years ago like you had sales ops and devops been there for a while now um maybe even 10 years or more uh but really in the last four or five years you start to see everywhere you start to see legal operations and hr operations and obviously marketing operations before that finance operations like all of those uh, departments are investing in that function uh, and you ask yourself well, what, what do they do <laughs> like what's their job right I thought IT is the one suppo supposed to like care about technology and and all that stuff and that is that gap that I think comes from oh shoot we need to invest more in uh, how we how efficient are we like yep. how do we leverage people better how do we leverage technology better and so on and so forth. And that pandemic, again, was even a stronger push. And one of our clients in, uh, you know, one of the three top tech companies in the world uh, always was about product. It was always about product. The, okay, the, the, go, the company goals was always about product. And after 2020, yeah. the first year that the company goals then the, in, the, in that top three was uh, Operation Excellency. Yeah. It just didn't happen before because they're like, eh, whatever. <laughs> The only it's only important that we'll keep generate more revenue and now you're realizing well actually you know you're very unstable um if you're uh, if you're spending everywhere and then you need to be do big cuts versus yeah. a bit more adaptive if you actually understand your processes if you're leveraging technology more if you're having more and we can talk about that no code concept but like really the ability to sort of do things faster then it kind of puts you in a different on a different place when you know something like that happens or when you want to make changes yeah that makes sense i mean let's let's talk about that no code thing for a second because i'm like it's interesting i like i'm curious where your head's at these days on it which is you know the dream in theory and i guess this gets into this question of like what operations teams you have versus like the team members themselves the dream has been pitched as you buy some of these solutions and then like, don't worry about it because it's low code, no code. So like the teams will just do this stuff for themselves magically and they'll like do it properly and like there'll be leverage out of it. Like what, I, I mean, where is the reality of that? You know what I mean? Between like actually teams can do this for themselves versus like, okay, it's, it's, it's you might not need engineers, but you do still need process driven. Like you need like a function doing that. Like how is that world evolving? Because I feel like the, it's almost even like to take a consumer version, like I'm not sure, I'm a big fan in theory of Zapier. Like Zapier is a sick product, right? And they've obviously, it's an incredible business. In practice, it's like pretty brittle and like even figuring out how to design your workflows around it is like pretty difficult. So like I have trouble imagining that in most companies with this like the, the low code push is actually the answer if you're expecting like the people to do it or like so what's organizationally happening how's that actually playing out yeah i think i think i think that the concept with uh, the example you gave with zapper is actually spot on so i have a very specific way of thinking about this that's not always very uh popular but i i actually don't think everyone can build things i think that's a myth that would never um that would never happen i think there are people there are people that are makers by nature and there are people that are not and that's okay um what I think it's important, though, is what does it mean to actually leverage software to do things for you, right? So, like, basically, access to that concept of software, and um, and so so the first the first myth in my mind is that concept of citizen developer. I don't think I don't I don't actually believe in it. I don't think everyone can be uh, a citizen developer. Um, what I do believe, though, is that there is a huge difference between low code and no code, and forget about the marketing. Uh, fluff around it, just conceptually. Um, low code means that you don't need to write as much code, but you still need to understand concepts of 
how data works, how APIs work, you know, how do you connect things? And I think Zapier is a good example to it because yes, it's faster to implement calling an API in Zapier than now, you know, typing in whatever language you want to do it. But if you don't understand how APIs work, you don't understand your own problem and how you're gonna architect it to work with those different zaps, then you're st you still need to be an engineer or you're gonna do something that you don't understand how it worked. And then you're gonna call IT when it stopped working and then IT is gonna hate you and yada, yada, yada. Uh, so low code is really helping developers do things faster, right? I think no code as a concept, and again, emphasizes on the concept, <laughs> as a concept uh, has a different potential, which is um, the way I think about it is making the pie bigger. So it doesn't mean that everyone can code with no code, but it means that a slightly more people can. Yeah. And so sort of the entry barrier, barrier of entry is different because you show like wrapping up, like, um, and you can, I can give examples, of, you know, out system just raised a lot of money, right? Like they're, um, they're helping you do that UI part, really no code. You just drag and drop cool things. But all the, all the, to make the UI work, it is low code. It's not actually no code. You have to actually know to code this stuff. Yeah. Uh, and so it is about abstraction. It's about sort of like creating those building blocks that just changes who is the person that needs to do those things. And the yeah. way I think about it is, think about uh, iOS, right? And like, uh, and like Objective-C or Swift or whatever. Like, I don't know, I, I used to write um, apps for Symbian, <laughs> for Nokia phone. That was terrible, man. That was like just, you know, not great, right? And iOS, Android, whatever, allows more people to write apps, but they're still developers. But it did increase the pie of who can do it. And that impact was ridiculous for the consumer world. Yeah, um, yeah. And so that's what's exciting in my mind but I think where it is right now is that we're still in that phase of the understanding what is that next layer of people that can build things with software. Yeah, and I guess like my understanding is a lot of big companies, like when they're using RPA S type solutions or, or like, you know, dragging up, they, what they're actually doing is outsourcing a lot of that work to like mm -hmm. India or like to teams that are specialized in effectively RPA development, right? Um, they're not actually like, taking the, oh, it's low code or no code and expecting their existing teams to necessarily work with it, which is interesting because it, to me, to your, I mean, I think to, you know, your iOS uh, analogy is also interesting, right? Because you did go through that phase, right? Of like IT consulting shops, right? On, on like a bunch of stuff, right? Where it's like, okay, like there technically are like APIs, like you technically can work with it, but it's significant. There's enough domain expertise and complexity to it that regardless of whether it's like high code or low code, you're still going to outsource it versus I guess maybe the test is like, can the team actually build their own workflows for themselves? Um, yeah, I think, I think it's true. And I think, and so where we play just for like context and the reason like we saw like no code for business operations is sort of where I find a niche, which is kind of fine to, funny to say, cause it's everywhere, but in that, in that landscape, is when you do think about those operation teams, they have domain expertise of their own process. Yeah. Right? They actually understand the people that are involved in the process, what they like, what they don't like, the tools that they have, the, the, the things that should work and the things that shouldn't work. And they can actually draw, it, draw a pretty detailed version of it on a whiteboard of how they yeah. want it to work. Uh, the gap for them is to now translate it to some, something that actually work within their environment. And so that's kind of where we're trying to abstract it. But I think yeah. you're absolutely right. Every time RPA becomes complex, every time integration platforms become complex, which is very often, um, they just put it offshore um, to, to someone to fix it. And that, that's, that's not very scalable. Interesting. Yeah. So talk about like, where are you seeing like the most like current like returns on kind of some of this like business process operation uh, automation stuff, especially around like places where like low code or no code solutions are, are playing. Like what, what are the killer, you know, the joke, just to put, to put kind of like some levity on it. It's like, I feel like when everyone explains this stuff, they're always like saying, we're going to automate like password resets. And in my head, I'm always just like, what does that even mean? It's like, who actually has a manual password reset anyway, right? So I'm kind of curious, like what you think like the highest like leverage places are, or like, you know, if you're building companies, where some of the stuff pays off the most. 
Um, you know, I'm going to throw a buzzword, but I actually think there's something behind it. I think that concept of human in the loop is actually is actually real. But for me, that concept comes from handoff between departments. So, you know, when you think about the uh, password research, that's like a task again. This is not like, this is not a process. It's like someone tasks this to, you know, and you write like, who does that manually anymore? I don't know. But that type of, um, that type of task um, is what we're usually, uh, people tend to go from, for automation use cases. I think where, where the biggest um, potential and the biggest gap, because the only way to solve it today is, is with actually writing code, uh, is when you start thinking about cross department processes. Um, example, we are tackling a lot is handoff between sales folks and legal, and then back to Salesforce and then to customer success kind of thing. So right, the handoff uh, of revenue process, each has their own technology stack, each has their own processes, and each department has their own ROI. Mm -hmm. right, so how do you how do you solve for that? Um, you piece piece meeting together like Salesforce and Zendesk and whatever CLM you have, like contract management system, this is not the point because the salespeople are not going to go to this, you know, new legal portal that you bought. They just don't care. Uh, yeah. They're just going to email the legal team. So like, how do you actually, you know, solve for that? Uh, I think that's, that's a huge area. And this is just one example. That's a huge area that where automation is just not touching. Um, yeah. People doing it over email or Slack um, and uh, have zero visibility zero repeatability and definitely not starting to create efficiency so and how much do you think like that is like almost in some ways like so it's interesting because like the other thing when you're doing handoffs right is like you think about the apis between departments right and you're just like okay for me to like properly handle this like i just i don't want to talk to you until these things are true like the problem with like a free form email is like i don't have any idea like how many like what you're actually saying and therefore how many things it's going to take back and forth to like address the thing Right. Whereas like in some ways it's like ironically, because you're talking about these things that are supposed to break down barriers, but in some ways, like I think one of the key bat battle ver like benefits to some of this stuff is like hardening APIs. Right. Um, like how do you think about that? Like where it's like the nice part about code is not only that like these like code platforms or these approaches like allow you to like automate some stuff, but like they're also they allow you to throw up effectively like more formal blocks, right? Um, like how do you think about that in rules? Um, so I think I understood what you're asking, but to, like, I think that standardization is actually what people are, are hoping to get from those tools. Um, yeah. if I go back to the Zapier thing, I think the biggest thing, um, is that I, I as far as I, you know, seen so far is that IT actually doesn't like Zapier at all. It's just a bunch of people try to do things with Zapier and now who, who's going to support this? Who's going to maintain this? You know, I didn't approve it. What the hell? Like, you know, all that thing. Um, and I think similarly, when you're, um, when you think about uh, some of those handoffs uh, from a business perspective, not from IT perspective, would be, let's put a form, let's put a portal, let's put a, like, let's harden the process so this can be easier for me to handle. Um, but that's easier for me. That's not necessarily easier for you. It's much easier for you to write two sentence emails, especially use, use them where you basically use any words in your emails, <laughs> right? Like you don't want to fill a form. That's just like, yeah. it's like too much extra work. Um, totally. And so, and that, that is actually why things I think fall down is because that's a very custom problem for, um, for these individuals. And SaaS by nature is a package apps. That's like where the value comes in. You just download from the shelf and you use it. And so there's that sort of like flexibility or agility or whatever into forming your own standard, you know what I mean? Like the end yeah. result, you want a standard, but to form it, you want the flexibility. So like piecemeal it the way you want it. Um, I think so that you know, like, the software like can negotiate between parties, right? Where it's like, I'm like, as a consumer at the end, I'm like, I want it this way. And you're like, fuck you. I want to write a two line email. And it, like, yeah. and you're just like, fine. Like, like we get, we're both going to have our way in some form. Right. And like, we're just going to like let software patch it between us. So it's like almost like it, it allows for hardening, but also for like making it not like a burden on everyone. That's an interesting yeah. way to think about it. Yeah, so yeah, Alex, exactly. Alex and Eric, I want to get you guys in the conversation because you're here and you both have perspectives on this stuff as well. And like kind of where low code, no code stuff is going. Like, 
I don't know. Like you li- you're listening to, to Sagi and I like bullshitting about this. Like what 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 resonates and what do you, what do you guys uh, disagree with and have different viewpoints on? I think um, <clears throat> at least speaking for myself, I think one of the challenges, right, is we the the kind of uh, target market that we have for for our kind of um, no code or low code platform is is kind of as blue collar as it gets, right? And so. Uh, we have no anticipation, like these are not people who are going to program. We have no anticipation they're going to program. And I think the, the open question is something kind of similar to what you guys were talking about, which is like, are they ultimately going to be the ones that we train to use this platform or are there going to be a third party, right? Like integrators or somebody who comes into a factory who's going to be the expert in the invisible platform and they're going to be the ones who set things up for you. Yeah. It's just going to be cheaper than if we do it, right? Like it's one of yeah. those things where... You know, I don't know. I think I think the thing that kind of always comes back to me is like travel agents, right? Like a travel agent is not a sophisticated, you know, computer user. They just knew this one computer system that they could like book all your tickets based off of. And that was a job based on their mastery of this one very specific computer system, right? Like they weren't programmers, they weren't. And so like, you know, there are jobs like that all over the place. And to some extent, some of these tools are kind of creating new jobs like that you're just i think to the idea of expanding the pie instead of requiring now that you're an expert in you know any kind of programming language whatsoever it's like you just have to you know spend three or four weeks to understand what each of these blocks means and now you can you know go off and make you know more than you would as a, as a barista or something right um sure. so i think it's yeah i don't know i just I think that that tension though is definitely it, right? Like in my mind, I think ideally, right? Everybody wants to believe that they're gonna have this inside the house. There's gonna be people internal who are gonna be experts and they're gonna be able to configure all these applications. But I think kind of as we roll these things out, that's that's definitely, well, you know. I think yeah, think we'll, yeah sorry, go ahead. So I, I completely agree. And I, and I actually think that what's interesting is that we're trying to see is that uh, people sometimes think about ROI and they'll tell me, look, if you can show me that with my system admin that I already have, I can not hire two engineer like uh, you know entry level engineers because that system admin can do more. Uh, right. That is an easy ROI for me, right? So, so I think your point stands regardless of whether that person is internal or external. Is the fact that now that person can become much more dangerous, right? right. With this with this technology. Um, and by definition, that's efficiency, right? That's le- like that's leverage because you can you, you can do more with less power, quote unquote. I mean, and, and arguably that's what an IT person is kind of anyways, right? Is like they've mastered this like workflow of whatever this computer system is, and it's not you know depending on how good of an IT person that you know they may or may not be able to even go to the command line, right? Like it's just one of those things that you know sometimes that's your your whole job, and and that's we're I think all lucky not to live in that world, but that's it's a world that a lot of other people live in where they just know that if you click on this button and then you click on that button, you know, we make a, a reservation for you. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, so, I think it's interesting. Yeah. You think about like why the narrative, like what this narrative about like consultants or like, you know, the, the ecosystem that supports this stuff. I actually think it's also like the software companies that are to blame for this. Like there's far more valuable companies to build, right? <laughs> in the in the world where it's like much more self-service. Like it's a much more compelling vision, right? Than just, like if, if the vision of a lot of this stuff really is like, okay, like, look, there's a lot of like semi-technical or low technical people, like, but they're still kind of technical to Sagi's point about like APIs. And like, we're going to basically, it used to be that they basically, the software so far outpaced them that they really couldn't build anything anymore for like most companies. So what a lot of this stuff does is like manage a bunch of the muck and complexity so that people can drag and drop like program better software for your teams right like this is that might be true but it's a lot less of like a sexy vision candidly right yeah. uh, if that makes sense um, yeah i'll share my perspective on <clears throat> yeah. how we do that like we're big users probably unusually big users of automations team wide even our engineers uh, right now write automations using like N8N, which is an automation tool that we use. <clears throat> so for us, uh, I, I was writing notes as, as uh, which uh, the way I heard them sound a bit different than, than how we're implementing internally. So for us, it's uh, it's like speed and cost. Like how fast can we go and test something out before putting it in the roadmap and like drop your sprint and like think about this feature. And it's like, and you lose the excitement and you move on. Now we can stitch something together uh, at very low cost at a, at a fast pace. 
and maybe iterate. And by the time we, we are all like, we're all bought into it. Now the engineering team builds a better version because we've already, um, which, and that shifted for us, uh, the, the thinking of like, uh, what I wrote here was like, let's use Zapier because I need a workflow that does X. Uh, and we now said, uh, Hey, I need a workflow that does X. It's like, no, actually what you need is a system that does approvals. So let's build a system that does approvals and you can now reuse an approval system uh, through the, for tags or for uh, categorization of, in our case, conversations and like moods and, and like all that stuff. So we, what we started to do is like build layers, like layer one is our code and our AP layer two is probably like N8N, which is super high frequency use, like probably the equivalent of 10 million tasks a month in, in Zapier. And then on top of that, we'll do Zapier if it's something that we need for today. And then maybe we, we upgrade it to N8N, then maybe we upgrade it to code. So we're using these things um, as layers uh, and we're, tr we're starting to train. Uh, we have a team of people in read JSON and like read an API at the base levels um, and then hopefully uh, go from there. So I, I don't know, it sounds from this conversation, we're very unusual. Like we don't look like the, the companies that, you, that you're uh, talking about, but maybe this is foreshadowing of, of what other companies might turn into, or maybe we're yeah. just there. Look, I, I, think it's, I think it's a really good point for what it's worth, which is like almost like thinking about like, you know, how much to, I mean, we talked a little bit about how like this stuff makes you much more nimble, right? Like in times of change or disruption, like the fact that you can kind of build your own, or it's like quick and cheap to like redo workflows or build a new workflow, or whatever is like very valuable. That's for sure true. Um, but like this whole idea that like you prototype and then like when you really, when you're really hardening things, you do end up building custom applications or taking things a layer deeper. I mean, I, I don't think you're, you're alone in that. I do think it's much more of a startup mentality than like a big company mentality. But I've also come across big companies that kind of have the same mentality effectively where they're like, okay, like we're kind of working on like redoing our entire like, you know, CRM system, right? But like, it's going to take us like six years, right? And yep. like, as we're redoing that, like we need like shorter, faster term solutions, which, but our theory is eventually we'll like consolidate it all into like our master platform. I wonder if for, for, for startups, I believe that that's probably true. You know what I mean? Which is like, you're building quickly and something new. I kind of wonder if like, I kind of wonder if big, and this is maybe to be too cynical, if big companies ever really achieve some of those like huge goals or whether what ends up really happening. And like, I've seen this in maybe some less well-run big companies is like, you kind of just like, your con change is so difficult that you end up just like building abstractions on abstractions on abstractions to try to keep up. So like, there's always a new interface, but like, if you go down enough levels, you're still running like cobalt somewhere, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. yeah, it's very true. Mainframe, by the way, it's true for so many companies. It's still, there's still a mainframe or an Oracle database somewhere there. <laughs> Things still flows into, and you can't <laughs> disconnect. Uh, one thing that I, I, did, I did like when you said, Alex, I agree with Sam. Like, I do think that that type of agility is is more prototyping is more like a startup blend. But what I do think that is similar that, that we've seen in bigger companies is that concept of like start to build uh, almost like a map of alternatives. Right? Like, when do I buy a seven figure vendor to just do this app versus when do I have custom build versus when do I use some local no code platform to uh, build it myself, right? And sometimes it's a matter of, um, you know, temporary solutions, right? Like I need this temporary, I need this for, for, for now, I need it for like one time thing or I need it for like a few months. Sometimes it's, uh, it's just a, a, a better approach because uh, it's so custom what you need and it's gonna change so many times that building it by IT is not gonna help because then it's gonna change and buying is not gonna be as custom as you need. So that's kind of where, I think that is uh, by large the, the potential, I think from a market, from a TAM perspective of set of problems um, of why this can be a long-term player and versus just a temporary transition phase. Because I do yeah. think that there is a big part of business problems that uh, you're gonna be better off having the control from the business side of things and, and have the custom ability um, of a custom code. So um, so I guess my, my question would be, so I think this, this conceptually kind of makes sense to me, right? So the idea basically, so I, I know uh, in the computer vision space, 
there's a lot of companies that will build a lot of internal tools to basically allow them to do random one-off computer vision products a lot faster, right? So it's kind of a similar idea that like you've built up this internal tooling and it's the build the basic building blocks and you can kind of put together them in the application really quickly. Um, like what are some examples in, I guess, like the business world where this would, this would be something that you would need to do kind of on a very regular basis? Like what are your internal processes you're ripping up and rebuilding on a kind of constant basis like that? So I think, well, I do want to separate those into two because there are the temporary, so the, the temporary thing that literally you just need to do one time. Let me give you an example. You're a big company, you bought another company. They have yeah. a bunch of tools. You need to migrate to like your Import tools. all their data and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So you need to import it. That's first. But then in the meantime, you need to somehow, they, they're they going to take a year to move them because they're stubborn and some people would never move. So you need them to vest out, <laughs> you know, those kind of things. And so that is like a temporary problem. Um, like again, temporary, it can take a few years, but still like from a strategic perspective is something that you're using for the time being. Um, and then the, the other side of it are, are, um, are processes that are so uh, cumbersome in the different stakeholders that exist there is that they're not, the process itself might morph in the future but the fact that you need something to stitch it together, or orchestrate it together, that's, that part is not gonna change. Um, and, and that's kind of where I talked earlier about the, the sort of like the between, between department sort of interface, interface between departments. Um, uh, so, you know, one of our customers, big company, um, in their legal department, they're working with law firms across the world and on, on processes like conflict waivers. You know, you guys, of signed conflict waiver at one point, um, like you want to automate that. How do you do that? Like, you, are you going to force all the law firms of the world to use a new UI? Are you going to use all of the, you force all the VPs that need to sign on a bunch of things across the company um, or on a hundred, hundred thousand people company to learn a new UI? They're just not going to do it. It has to be over email. You know, there's not going to be a conflict waiver vendor, <laughs> someone that build just for that's super specific to you. So your alternative is either write custom code or do nothing, right? And do nothing means that you're gonna put heads on it. Uh, Cause that's, you know, cause someone needs to do it. So you're gonna hire people. Anyway, yep. long story short, that type of solution is a solution that is not gonna go away. That's just, that is the app that you're now building to solve this problem. And you're gonna, Keep on using it for years to come, just like you're gonna use Salesforce for years to come, kind of thing. I don't, yeah. I hope, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's kind of what I've been seeing. Yeah, no, it's 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 just no, it is. It's it's interesting to think about kind of how these solutions work. And, and again, I think like like who is the person ultimately that's writing this solution? How long is that solution gonna exist inside of your company? How how often are you gonna change it? These are all questions I think that kind of are applicable. I'll, across I'll give you another one, else. Eric. That. I mean, now I'm just gonna straight pitch Sigi's company, but like I've actually gotten increasingly like convinced that he is totally right about this, which is the privacy and security layer. So basically, here's the upshot: is like the other thing that's changing all the time is like privacy and security requirements in a lot of ways. Like at this point in history, and moreover, sure. like one of the most complicated things, like if you think about Zapier, just because everyone probably is familiar with this, who's watching now or later or whatever, like or you should be if you're not. It's like the real value of Zapier, if you kind of know how to code, is actually not even like pushing and pulling data around. It's just managing all the credentials. Like, honestly, like that's why I use it. Like, why do I use Zapier to like, for some like maybe little tasks to like, you know, build spreadsheets? Like, I actually find, I would rather just write it myself because I actually, versus use their interface, but it's so fucking annoying to deal with OAuth and the credentials and whatever else that like you kind of just use them and so like they manage that for you, right? And so to me, I think that's the other thing that's kind of, I think, missing and changing is like, we're talking about like this kind of spectrum around low code, no code on like, how long is it going to last? Rip and replace, who can build it? But I think the other thing to keep in mind is like, if you just like want anything to happen, like there's more and more security and privacy hooks into everything. And like, you kind of need a layer to manage all that stuff right that's like abstracted from what you're actually doing with it um 
So like the yeah. actual task, it might take you the same amount of time to like write it in like four lines of Python or put it in a Zapier or something. The difference is, is that you won't have to do the extra work of kind of coordinating credentials across multiple that, applications. That, that, I'll, that, add, that, I'll add one that. more uh, around those same lines, which is uh, audit logs and retries. Yeah. Like if you write it yourself and you need to retry it three days later because it didn't go through originally, it's, it's, it's a button. And there's an audit log and all that stuff. Yeah. Or, or it's just like in big organizations that have more compliance issues. It's not just like the credential management. It's literally just like, there is a guy that's actually in some ways even scarier than IT, right? And his job is to like make sure that like consumer privacy is protected or like you're not violating some terms of service somewhere or whatever. And none of that stuff is like, I mean, once you, if you have APIs, like a lot of that stuff is like actually like, it's pretty hard to like keep it encoded properly effectively. And so like, if you can just be like, look, like, you satisfy me so long as it's piped through here and I can change the rules whenever I want, whatever. Like, yeah. I don't actually care. This is a blessed off path for. and it's just, yeah. Right. Um, it's like so now, did, I, did I do a good job pitching your company, Sagi? Because like, I feel like that's kind of, like the thing that you, you've evolved obviously a lot and like, I think that's like the key insight of a lot of this stuff is like the, the kind of, it's kind of brutal, but like the reality of a lot of like the RPA world, back office optimization, whatever, like, it's just a lot of it's going to come down to this, right? Which is like someone like wants to make a data request, like how the fuck are you going to fulfill that, right? Like things like that, like being like a really important set of issues. It's true. It's true. And it's also, it's also, so it's the combination of compliance is the combination of data management and access management and control management. And it's also sort of like creating standardization around, you know, interfaces. Like how do you interface? You know, the biggest, one of our biggest use cases, funny enough, is actually orchestrating internal systems, like custom custom build systems within big companies that Zapier can do, but more more like, because again, you can call it the HTTP request, but like we already said that people are not sophisticated enough to understand how to handle that in scale. Um, it's really creating that sort of like layer of, of, of abstraction on top of, you know, your, your systems and, 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 and information, but in a standardized way that IT likes, that you know, logs everything to their SOX compliance and handle their renewals and data retention. And they can decide, I don't want HR to see legal stuff, but I don't want to see, uh, sales to see HR stuff, you know, but I do want them to be able to know whose manager is who, but I don't want Workday API to be available here, only here, blah, 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 blah. You know, all the, that metrics of Control is, I, that's why, by the way, we call ourselves the operating system for business operations, by the way, not because to sound grandiose, because at the other time it's a hardware and software. It's like, what do I want you to, ch to touch in the hardware? What I don't want you to touch in the hardware. Uh, and it's more of like, you can use memory, but only in the space that I allocated to you <laughs> versus, yeah. you know what I mean? That which, kind of which thing. Just to push, I mean, I think this kind of brings our conversation a little bit full circle, which is at the beginning, you're we talking about this whole, like, well, not in the middle, maybe it's more the middle, but like, <laughs> about like hardened APIs, right? And this idea that like different departments are doing interdepartmentally, like they really want to harden the APIs to make their lives doable, right? But the business users or the other departments don't necessarily want to interface in that way. And the ultimate hard API is becoming these like privacy security functions, right? Where like they can really be like, you do it my way or like you just can't do it. And no one has the power to push back on them, right? And because of that, like in a lot of ways, like they're the ultimate hard API, but right now so much of what they do is not actually like programmatically hardened. You know what I mean? It's like policy hardened. And so encoding that policy into, look, you guys can write whatever rules you're going to write. I know I have no power over them. Like, but don't, but like, I, I'm like instant compliant with whatever you've invented is like a really interesting, like, but you harden the APIs and you also make the life for the business users easier. Absolutely, hundred percent. It's interesting, hundred um, percent. Yeah, I think it's it, there's just something that I see a lot, at least in, in the manufacturing world, which is like, uh, you know, there's again, there's a lot of kind of like quasi technical people. They're building a lot of kind of one-off solutions specifically for this this part of the factory or whatever. But then there's an open question about whether any of that actually communicates to the same back system, which is also hyper custom. Right. And like at the end of the day, you wind up with in like one facility, you know, 
a half dozen places that, that data that they would love to have all kind of collated in the same place exists. And there's not necessarily the same kind of concept of, of individual privacy, maybe, but definitely yeah. in the sense that like, you know, this is something where if there was a way to kind of bring all well, of these I things back into the same with, system, that would be it, interesting. It was a little bit like what Alex said, which is my only real experience firsthand working in manufacturing was optimizing some factories when I was like right out of school at Bain and Company. And like, this was like now 10 years ago, but like our job was basically trying to figure out how to like get data from different systems and then like make really basic trucks, right? <laughs> like, because, because, you know, again, the, the audit logs weren't standardized, you know, the things like that, yeah. and a whole bunch of ways. So I, I just wonder, I mean, like, it's an interesting set of things. I mean, it's kind of one of those things where like, obviously we all know the branding of like low code, no code movement and like the op opportunities around back office are like, this is not actually the way it's pitched at all, right? The pitch is efficiency, save money, empower your team, blah, blah, blah. Right. But I do wonder if actually when we look back in a bunch of years, some of the stuff we're talking about now is actually like actually the value of it, right? Versus what came before. Because I, I don't know. I don't know if that you know, sense. the funny part is that yeah. that's sort of like interface hardening and standardization, which you're talking about from a policy perspective. If you think about it, it applies to many other things. How many startups pitched you, Sam, on um, helping sales people fill the CRM without filling the CRM? Yeah. Right? Like tons. Well, what is that actually? It's the same thing. The, the, the company, entity of the company, need the data in the CRM to do forecasting. Just like you know, um, but the privacy team needs it to be an audit log so they can meet the SOX team, right? But that's not what salespeople care about. They, they want to close deals and now they need to fill a bunch of, you know, it's the same problem um, and it's the same concept of like, there is a gap between sort of like the ROI of the business user and, and, and the ROI of the process, if you will. Um, and that interface is, yeah. is in a way, an, a, 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 a easier way for you to sort of like create the, those um yeah or, or put, even if you want to be even broader this might be a fun direction to, to close it out on but i want to make sure sigi and you guys have last word is like <clears throat> look in life there are two ways to do things right incentives and rules right like that's it that's all that exists is like incentives and rules if an individual <clears throat> person at a company's um incentives were like perfectly aligned with the businesses and then yeah. maybe this would be less of a problem. I mean, you still have a lot of complexity to handle. Like there's still things that machines do better than people that are, uh, but it is interesting. Like if a lot of this kind of movement stuff is, is actually about being like, look, the incentives aren't perfectly aligned. There is stuff I just need, but I know that like, you don't care that I need them to some degree. And so therefore, or like, you know what I mean? Like, because you have a slightly different set of incentives, like you use kind of software to like mediate effectively the debate <laughs> is like, a very different way to think about a lot of this kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's, anyway. That's interesting. I will say that there are companies where it's like the opposite, right? Like if you're, if you care about the company, you actually like subvert the process so that you can like get things done more easily. Yeah. You know what I mean? And more that, quickly. That's more the nimbly. finest part that your top performance a a is probably not feeding the Salesforce ever. <laughs> no, no, I, I totally agree. And for, for what it's worth, I mean, this is actually a place that the company I've been working on comes into play a lot. It's in the analytics, right? Because like what our whole, one of our whole pitches is like, look, we need to understand how all your people are doing all these processes. Because I promise you, there's some that are really good at it. And what they're doing is not actually what the documented process is. So we need to know what they're doing. And then we should like basically learn the best practice bottom up, not like top down, like I say, this is what has to be done, but actually bottom up, let's look at all the data. Let's figure out who's actually good at this and then figure out why they're good at it, right? Um, and use that process, right? Um, start, start building the tools specifically for them so that they enter their stuff in correctly exactly. and hope yeah. everybody else will follow it. And, yeah, yeah. and now you pitch my company too. <laughs> there <we go. laughs> Fair enough. That's good. Guys, before, so before we close up, I, uh, Ziggy, I really appreciate your time. And like, I know there's a lot of people who are going to be interested in hearing kind of some of these, these thoughts. Uh, Alex, Eric, you guys as, as being on the line, um, any other things you want to ask Ziggy about or things you want to bring up on this topic before we let him close? Uh, I, I do have a question. Like, Ziggy, if you could share um, what are your better use cases right now that so, so I, I've checked out your pricing. There's a reason that we don't use you, at, le at least not yet. Uh, so uh, at what point uh, does that make sense? What, what would be like a good point of entry to becoming a good Tonkin customer? 
Uh, so I think what we've seen, and it's it's less about the uh, the use case. It's more about the the point in life of the company where there's a backlog of things that you need to either buy, like spend money on on new vendors on, or spend engineering time, and you're just you're you're just not gonna get to it. And so at that point. Yeah, let me give you an, like a, a, a small example. We have one co- company that is a healthcare company that have uh, we want, wanted to do a COVID test process, a program that just handle COVID tests and send it to medical. They won a contract that they needed to do. They went to engineering team. They told them six to nine months. Like, well, I don't know what's going to happen in six to nine months. And then the one guy there that is using Tonkin was like, ah, I can build this in Tonkin. And he built that from ideation to live in production nine business days. And I'm, this is not a toy. This is handling 2 million uh, COVID tests a month, right? So I think the, the, the reason why we're only working currently with um, a billion dollar plus in revenue type of companies is because you go into the company, you realize anywhere you look, there's a backlog of things that they wanted to do and never got budget to do. And at that point, the price point that you see on the website is peanuts for those things. Of course, two yeah. engineers on any problem, and it costs you far more than this, right? So, like, so that's I don't know if that answers your question, but that's sort of like, it's a it's a matter of alternatives, of like, what is the alternative of solving those problems? Um, is there even a vendor that can do that, or you need to write custom code? If there is a vendor, you know, some of the bigger companies, every new vendor, that's a seven figure problem with you know vendor security assessment and yada 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 yada. But they already have Tonkin spinning another solution or another module that's like free. Like it costs the Tonkin license, but it's free from all that, from from all that uh, uh, logistics perspective. So that the the price you guys charge is per kind of quote unquote solution. So like when you set up a workflow, that each one of those gets its own license. So that's actually something interesting. We uh, so, um, workflows for us are like our modules. Um, and their host within a solution. So we actually went from that best practice of engineering. How do I bring best practices of engineering to people that are not engineers? So one of the biggest problem with zaps is that to solve one problem, you might have 20 zaps that you now need to architect and understand and all that stuff. And that's also a big problem for people that are not engineering. They don't have sure. the idea of testing in, you know, yeah. in, in build, one of the mental tests, abstractions, fraud, right? Yeah. yeah, CI, CD, all that stuff. Uh, so a solution you can think about as a repository in a way uh, you can build there whatever you want, but in reality, what you're actually going to build there is solving one business problem, whether it's two workflows or 50 workflows, I'm not going to charge you differently, whether yeah. it's a million actions or 10 actions, I'm not going to charge you differently because 10 action, maybe every action there is extremely high value for you versus a million actions. Every one action is not valuable for you, you know? So like Absolutely. we actually don't nickel and dime on that. You want to solve this problem? What's the alternative? Building or buying a vendor? Oh, okay. Um, 60K to solve this problem is actually um, uh, a no brainer, right? Um, so that's do, totally do, sort of the- Do you guys do like training and stuff for the, the people that kind of like become an internal an internal expert? Are they typically in engineering? Like who, who is it that you guys are training to, to use this? Yeah. Um, we, we do we do some training um, and obviously some of the you know um, some of the stuff are are self self served because it's part of the concept right it's kind of easy to use uh, usually it's either uh, it's either the ops teams so le- for example sales ops sales ops right the same person that that does manage Salesforce build stuff in Tonkin um, or legal ops. Um, Sorry, and so on. And sometimes it's the BizTech team. Um, so BizTech, Corp Eng, they call themselves different names, but it's a team within IT that's responsible for the business applications. Um, and sometimes, and that really depends on the company, whether they're doing like a center of excellence type of model or more of like a satellite model. Uh, but long story short, think about it as system administrator. So they're not, they're not the people that they cannot code. They don't know how to code. All they understand is their world. So they can do marketing automation, they can do sales stuff, they can do contract uh, forms, but they don't actually know how to code or even how to use Zapier sometime. Um, and so 
for them though, it's like drag and drop type of thing. Uh, it always goes for my tea though for us, because like Sam said, that's actually what we sell is that centralization. So IT would come sort of define the enterprise components, we call them sort of create a sandbox for you to play. Kind of give you the, the you inputs and outputs, so to speak. Yeah. And then you can kind of connect the dots in between there. Separating DAL, think about it, dot access layer from BL. Makes right? sense. So you can, you can so, so that separation. Makes sense. It's cool. 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 Well, Siggy or Alex, do you want to jump in on anything before we close up? I, I know we're running a little bit over the time we, we allotted for this. Cool. All good. Well, oh, I'll just say thank you, Sigi, again for, for having this conversation. Like, I'm, you know, we're both really interested in this topic, and I, I think like this actually was very interesting. So I appreciate yeah. you taking some time out of your day to bullshit about it, uh, <laughs> Eric and Alex. Thanks for, for joining as well. And yeah, right, we'll, we'll send notes around. Thank you guys. That was a great discussion. Great, great questions. That was fun. Cool. Thank you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Good to see you.